I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food, and thank you for joining me. We have an important show today. I'm sure many of you are struggling and reeling from all of the violent activity that's going on in the United States and all around the world, especially these last few weeks. And I want to talk about things that are going on in this world that are good and the work that is being done by amazing activists that are incredible. And I really want to focus on getting the violence out of our own lives and how we do that. And some of it has to do with what's on our plate. So let's just jump right in. My first guest is Amy Jean Davis, an animal rights activist, spokesperson for the SAVE movement, and the founder of LA Animal Save, the Los Angeles chapter of the global save movement. Davis graduated Purdue University in 2004 after having become a vegan in 2002 and started an animal sanctuary in Los Angeles. And in 2015, she completed her certificate in plant-based nutrition from E. Cornell. And in 2016, Amy founded LA Animal Save, which is now the largest chapter of more than 600 save groups worldwide. Amy also works with her partner, filmmaker Sean Monson of Earthlings and Unity Films, creating films and other media for animal rights movement. Originally from a small town in Indiana, Amy came to Los Angeles in 2008 as a top 24 finalist on season seven of American Idol. Amy, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Karen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so lots of lots of awful things are going on, <laughs> and and uh, I think, uh, at least from my point of view, uh, the things that have been going on with the white supremacist terrorists in our country are terrible. But what the point that I try and make very often is, we allow so much violence to go on when it comes to food and sentient animals, innocent animals. And and so there's this irony going on where some violence just seems every day and okay, but it isn't. And as long as we allow for that, I think the violence will only get worse all around us. How do you feel about it? Yeah, well, I have a couple uh, responses to that. Um, we live in a society that has this foundation of institutionalized violence, and it's against the most vulnerable beings, uh, the animals. They don't, uh, they their voices are not heard. Uh, they don't have any rights, um, and so we have this system of co- uh, total institutionalized violence, not just because we slaughter animals, but also the way that we treat them uh, with the the body mutilations on the farms, whether it's a factory farm or a small farm, and the uh, living conditions, the transportation uh, processes, everything about farming for animals is, is abhorrent and abusive. And yet we teach our children <clears throat> from a very young age that that you know we love animals and if you walk through the the book section uh the children's book section of any store you'll see that all of the books most of the books are about animals and we don't just make books about dogs and cats and horses we have so many books about pigs and cows and chickens and yet we turn around and we hand these children tortured body parts to eat and so there's there's a major problem going on uh, at the very core of our our society, what we what we put in our mouths, and everybody has to eat. So this is an issue that this is a reality that affects everyone. And we're taught from a very young age, kill and also love some animals, which isn't possible. So it's a it's a twisting of the mind and of the heart, and then also you know love and protect some animals such as dogs and cats. And um, we need to we need to get at the core of these issues to start teaching our children that as long as someone can suffer, meaning they're sentient, they can feel pain, they can feel love, as long as they can suffer and feel those, those kinds of things, they should be protected. And what is a result of that 
is we could have a foundation of institutionalized compassion. We could have a system that doesn't send the wrong messages to children from the very beginning, trying to essentially snuff out their sense of compassion. Instead, we have a society that understands if someone can suffer, we protect them. And there's no mixed message. Now, the other thing I want to mention real quick is that I went to a screening of a documentary called Newtown, and it was about the Sandy Hook. It's about the Sandy Hook massacre. Mm. And the, the filmmakers were there to do a QA and a at the end. And they, somebody asked a question, and they answered uh, about animal cruelty and the link. And they said, yes, there, there is a link between animal cruelty at a young age and then those children growing up to commit acts of violence on other humans. Yet, still, no one is talking about how we, as parents, are forcing our children into these acts of violence before before they even know what's happening. Some might call it child abuse. I would call it child abuse. Yep. Not only for the psychological and emotional abuse that's happening, but also for the physical abuse. Uh, when heart disease is our number one killer and it shows up in every 10-year-old in this country who's eating the standard American diet, that's child abuse on multiple levels. I agree with you. Now, let's talk about the SAVE movement. Can you tell mm -hmm. me about that? Yes. Now, the SAVE movement is a global network of activists, and we started out as a, a group called Toronto Pig Save. Anita Kreins is our founder, and she started this group off uh, in around 2010, uh, holding vigils outside slaughterhouses uh, because she happened upon a transportation truck full of pigs one day when she was out watch walking her newly adopted dog, Mr. Bean. So she started this off in Toronto in 2010. It has since grown now it's global, and not only do we have the animal save movement part, we also have climate save movement and we have health save movement. As you know, eating animals causes so many global, global crises. I mean, just so many different problems from the environmental impact, the animal cruelty impact, the oppression of factory farm and slaughterhouse workers, to world hunger, species extinction, and of course, causing most of our top reasons of dis disability and death in this country and others. And so since it affects so many things and creates so many problems, we, have, we now have different sections of the SAVE movement to try to raise awareness, educate the people, and get people to be active, not only for the animals, but for their own health and for the planet. I remember first hearing about Toronto Pig Save and everything that they were doing. I didn't realize that they were the first in the Save yeah. movement and the seed to the entire Save movement. That's that's very yeah. exciting to hear. Yeah, it really launched in 2015 when Anita was actually arrested for giving water to pigs outside of a slaughterhouse. And she yep. was on trial for two years. And I really believe that the animal agriculture industry was hoping that this trial would really scare the rest of the activists away from speaking up for animals and, and, and bearing witness to them. But it had a completely opposite effect, exploded the whole SAVE movement. And now um, I actually think that we have over 700 groups now. It's growing so fast that we, I think we have over 700 groups now globally. And, and Anita definitely is, is at the very beginning of it. It, I'm just sickened by what can happen in our society when someone is trying to do something with great compassion, give someone suffering some water to drink, and how it blew up into this nightmare. And fortunately, a lot of good has come out of it. And, and you know, we see the same thing now with um, people trying to get into the country from our southern borders and there there are compassionate people who are, who want to leave them water and give them water and they're arrested so what we do to animals we do to people and it's all a disaster but i'm very encouraged to hear that more people are realizing that they need to get active and make all of this what's going on make us aware of it and fight it every way that we can because I, re I think that we're really meant to be good, and maybe 
it's this subliminal um, subconscious kind of training that we get as a youngster that makes us end up being so confused that we do horrible things as an adult. I, I can't explain it. The, yeah, the, uh, the ability for the animal ag industry, meat, dairy, and also the medical and the pharmaceutical industries and the government all working together, they are really well equipped to completely and utterly brainwash the people to where they are speaking up, defending animal cruelty and defending the degradation of the planet and defending oppression against low income uh, neighborhoods, defending food deserts and and they don't even know why. So so we do have a a large villain here and it's a it's a complicated one and it's a powerful one, but bringing people to the vigils that we hold in the save movement when we stand outside the slaughterhouses and stop the trucks before they go in and offer those animals water and we see them when we raise awareness and bear witness like this it it reactivates uh, what I believe everyone has this natural sense of compassion. They see these animals. They see that they're no different from our dogs and cats. They see that these animals do not want to die and they get re reconnected with their natural sense of compassion. And then they want to say, you know what, I am not going to be a part of this anymore. And beyond that, I am going to do something to help raise awareness also in whatever my strengths are. Cause everybody, everybody has their different strengths when it comes to activism and bearing witness seems to activate a lot of people. Now, you founded LA Animal Save. Can you tell us some of the events that you've been involved with? Sure. With LA Animal Save, we have held a vigil almost every single week outside of a, a large pig slaughterhouse in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, we usually get around 100 people out there every week. And we have a partnership with the local police department to uphold our right to bear witness. Um, and so each truck stops for a few minutes. We give the water and we take pictures and video and we create as peaceful and loving of, of a, like a surrounding and atmosphere as we can for these animals. And we share their faces and their stories on social media. And so we've been doing this every week. At the pig slaughterhouse, we go every other week to a cow slaughterhouse in the area and every other week to a chicken slaughterhouse in the area. And uh, we also just started a fur save uh, group, and we are holding monthly vigils in Beverly Hills at the uh, stores that still sell fur. Even though Los Angeles is now a fur-free city, uh, that, that law won't actually take into effect for another, uh, let's see, a year or so. Mm. But we still want to raise awareness to to the passersby that fur is not fashion. Uh, so there's a lot of these vigils that we hold all of the time. And we also work in partnership with other animal rights groups and help promote their their events, such as Anon Anonymous for the Voiceless with their Cubes of Truth. Um, and, and so we try to work with all the other groups to build up this activist community because we, we are the ones that are going to change the world and we need to do it as soon as possible. These animals are suffering, people are suffering, and we have a limited amount of time left on the planet. I'm wondering how you stay strong and stay sane amidst all of the violence that you see every week during these vigils. Well, I won't lie it is difficult um i i do tell people though that i think i have an easier responsibility as an organizer of the vigils because i'm there um i have uh, a lot of our information that we put out especially because vegans will bring their non-vegan friends and family members and i want to make sure they're equipped with information on how to go vegan once they are impacted by seeing these animals and so i have to take, uh, you know, responsibility for these people and their safety. I'm, I'm uh, interacting with the police officers and the truck drivers. And so I don't actually get a lot of opportunity to bear witness to the actual pigs myself. I see them, I hear them, I smell them. Um, but I have so many things that I have to take care of that I have an easier job. I am amazed by the vigil uh, attendees that come every week and give water to these, to these animals and and give these animals their love and somehow they keep coming back every week. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with recognizing that it is an obligation that we have when we, when we know they're suffering, we come closer to it and we do something to try to help. 
and people these people understand it's an obligation that they have and they keep coming back but people need to be careful they have to have self care because if we if we aren't uh, fully charged and able to do the best that we can do, uh, then then others will suffer. So we, we have to take care of ourselves as well. I'm curious about this relationship that your vigils have with the police. How has that started and how are you able to successfully create this work relationship that you have? Uh, well, I believe that part of it is because I have also... Uh, received an education from uh, this woman named Alison Armstrong, who studies human beings, men and women. And she figures out some of the uh, instinctual ways that we communicate. And a lot of these instincts actually will trigger each other instead of, you know, working in partnership. So because I, I learned from her, there are that there are certain things that we can do to actually prohibit quality communication. I believe I was able to communicate to these police officers that we are there not to do anything illegal, that, that we want to work with the police, that we want everybody, everybody to stay safe. We're not interested in property destruction. All we want to do is bear witness to these animals. And I believe that they heard me and uh, they felt respected by me. And uh, that is part of what facilitated this, this partnership. And it, it happened really from the very beginning. And it's been, it's been awesome. Do you know, have you, have you changed the minds of any of those police officers? Yes, uh, at least two of them have gone vegan, and many of them have requested vegan information from one of our attendees, Brian Carroll, who's always out there leafleting. Uh, he talks to them every vigil about veganism. And so these, these police officers are curious. And uh, like I said, two of them have gone vegan. One was already vegan. And I believe that that will just continue to grow within the police department. And maybe one day they'll even let me come in and give a presentation on, on uh, a plant-based diet and, and how that, that uh, you know, heals our body instead of, instead of hurts it. That's fantastic. I'm thinking about Rip Esselstyn, who got his entire fire department crew to go vegan and wrote yeah. a book about it. And uh, I would love to see something similar like that happen to a particular precinct where all the cops yeah. go vegan. Maybe yeah, that will happen in L.A. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I know Rip. I've been to his Engine 2 immersion, and he is awesome. The whole Esselstyn family, they're just fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Our, do you have children? I have one. Yes, I do. Yeah. I have one and little eight-month-old eight baby. Oh, my goodness. Eight-month-old. <laughs> so... What's your plan for raising this child in this world? Oh boy! In terms of That's... veganism and food and being an activist and being strong to stand up against what's all around us. Yeah. So it's a, it's such an a, an overwhelming thought, you know, that I I want to equip my baby with everything she needs to know to to. Uh, stand her ground and, and live her truth and understand why. And so obviously she's, she's going to be, uh, fed a vegan diet. Uh, right now she's still on breast milk mostly, but we have a little fun with cherry tomatoes and avocado. Um, but I do plan on explaining to her why we don't eat animals because I understand the pushback that she will be around, whether it's from friends and family or, strangers or just all of the propaganda advertisements that are everywhere from the fast food industry or on TV. And I, I know that she's going to need to understand why we don't eat animals so that if someone asks her, she knows why instead of going, well, it's just, it's something that we, you know, we just don't do it in our house or in our family. That's not a good enough answer. I want her to understand that we are against injustices, whether it's against animals, people, or the planet. Uh, that's what we are, that's what we're against. And so that's why we completely opt out of it by living that vegan lifestyle. When children are educated this way, what I've seen is that they become the most amazing, effective adv activists. I, I hope so. I, you know, I love watching the other um, kid activists like uh, Genesis Butler out there doing, doing their thing, raising awareness and not afraid to speak up against these giants, whether it's mm -hmm. the industries 
or the giant that is the social norm where so many people are brainwashed into thinking we love some animals but eat others and and they just can't understand how anybody would do you know something different than than that that which this you know society has collectively agreed is what we do well uh, my my uh, daughter will understand that we don't just go along with our culture. We question our culture, and we make sure that the things our culture has taught us are based in truth and based in kindness. And if not, we don't follow. We're just not going to do that. Speaking of giants, can we go back to your vigils? So you have this respectful, wonderful relationship with the police, and you have wonderful volunteers, many of them continuing to come back to the vigils, what about the companies, the slaughterhouses that you are in front of, that you're protesting against? Have they ever come out and communicated, started any kind of dialogue, or tried to make you leave? Uh, great question. I'm so glad you brought this up because it's my opportunity to talk about how the SAVE movement is love-based. So we do not engage in any kind of arguing or debating, and especially not conflict, whether it's with workers, with passersby or, um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, authority figure within the company. And so we've never, with the pig slaughterhouse, we've never had any direct uh, communication. I will tell you, though, that um, they have, and I I, I know this because the police officers have told me, uh, the slaughterhouse has told the police officers that if we have any problems with any of the truck drivers not allowing us to bear witness and give water that we can tell the police officers and they will talk to the pig slaughterhouse people and they'll take care of it. Mm. So, yeah. So even the pig slaughterhouse knows why we're there and in a weird way is, is somewhat on our side and the cow slaughterhouse, we've actually rescued numerous cows from the slaughterhouse when a baby is born in the holding pen uh the owner himself cannot bring bring himself to send that baby through the slaughter line and so we've been able to actually rescue numerous mothers and babies from the cow slaughterhouse and we've you know we've been in talks with that owner to try a plant-based diet and and uh we want to facilitate dialogue we want to facilitate communication because you know, fighting isn't going to get us anywhere. We're already on two separate sides, vegan, not vegan, for kindness, for violence. So if we can facilitate a conversation, then that's where possibility lies. And we can do that without, you know, saying that what they're doing is okay. I'll never, ever say, oh, well, you know, you you slaughter the animals a little better than other slaughterhouses. Absolutely not. You know, you you can have a conversation with a non-vegan, but without diluting your stance. And, you, you know, a lot of people think, oh, how could you even talk to them? Well, because what, what, what would happen if we were able to convert a slaughterhouse owner to veganism and to see, make that connection? Big things will happen. And I know mm-hmm. we will get there, whether it's LA Animal Saves Group or one of the other save groups around the world. They will get through to these slaughterhouse owners. and and get that that business gone or converted to something different. For example, you know, manufacturing plant-based meat. Absolutely, which is just exploding. Yes. Oh, it's so exciting. I just, oh, I'm so excited. And I even will actually send screenshots of these news stories to one of the slaughterhouse owners and just to let him know, look, this is this is the future. You know, I don't want you to lose your job, lose your business. Convert now, you know, get mm-hmm. out of the animal ag business, and uh, you know you'll you'll be doing great things for the world. There, are, there are already so many stories about people that have raised animals or slaughtered animals and had the veil lifted, and mm-hmm. were very regretful for what they did. And some did it because it was in their family for traditions, and it was just what they did, and they didn't know how to do anything else. But I know deep down, it it can't feel good to anyone. It yep. can't. So what you're doing is chipping away and and giving people an opportunity to and I, yeah, make make the right choice. Yeah, yeah. To let them know that, you know, th- there is there is a good reason to be on the right side of history and to change your business. And just to 
think about how it doesn't feel good to kill animals. I, um, I work for another nonprofit and I go into high schools and teach these kids about plant-based eating. And I ask them, how many of you um, think about the slaughterhouse workers? And do you know that they suffer, a lot of them suffer from PTSD? And I said, how many of you want to get a job in a slaughterhouse or a factory farm when you graduate high school? And nobody raises their hand. I said, well, you know, this is, this is a job for a lot of people. Although according to the USDA, around 78% of that workforce are immigrants. And so a lot of them, you know, are taken advantage of as well and, and not given medical uh, compensation when they get hurt, even though it's a very dangerous job. And so we don't want to do this job, but we go and we buy the products and mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're funding that whole industry. So not only are the animals getting abused and murdered, but these human beings are taken advantage of as well. And they don't want to be there, but a lot of them only have so many choices on the jobs that they can take. And it's between this terrible job that they don't like, and it doesn't make them feel good on any level or, you know, not being able to feed their family. It's the worst of worst jobs. Yep. From so many points of view. Oh, okay. So, where can people find out about the Save Movement, start their own chapter, and get get to work? Absolutely. So they can go to thesavemovement.org, thesavemovement.org, and look up how to start their own group. If they're in the Los Angeles area, they can go to uh, laanimalsave.org and uh, get all the information on us. And our, our social media accounts are also connected there. And we have regular vigils every week and every month. And so we we encourage everyone to come out and do it at least once. Come out, bear witness to the animals at least once. Because it's actually easier to be at a vigil than to watch watch it on live stream or to see the Mm. pictures and and video. Because when you're there, you actually get to relieve an animal's thirst for just a moment. And I'll tell you, it's worth it. It's worth it to come in down there and do that and say, I see you. You are not a faceless, nameless commodity or property. I see you. You're an individual, and I'll tell your story. And it impacts you. And a lot of people, most people, get get active and want to do something more for the animals. So I encourage everyone to come down and bear witness at least once, even though it seems like it would be a very hard or very sad thing to do. You won't regret it. Okay, before we go, I just want to lighten it up a little bit. You're in mm-hmm. Los Angeles, which is a mecca for fantastic vegan food. Do you have some yeah. favorite places to go? Well, Veggie Grill is my go-to. I remember when I when I uh, gave birth to my daughter, the first meal I wanted was a Beyond Burger from Veggie Grill with the chopped <laughs> cheese and the <laughs> french fries. And so Veggie Grill is just one of my favorites, uh, for sure. And then um, locally here, we also love Joy Cafe. And they're a, um, you know, all gluten-free, organic, amazing, you know, restaurant. So we love going there as well. But there's so many good places. It's like, ah, uh, how do you, you can't really pick a favorite. I know. <laughs> and and it I'm depends so on your mood. Grateful. Yeah, there's so totally. many choices. Yeah. yeah. The food is delicious. There's no reason. There's no reason for this violence no, and this cruelty. No reason. No, no reason. No reason at all. And so, uh, that you know, on, a, on that note, I am excited about Burger King rolling out the Impossible Whopper because I know how many cows that burger is going to save and how it's going to start to push that, that needle over towards, you know, the normalization of being vegan. And so many more people are going to go, I had no idea that I could eat food like this and be vegan and I'll give it a try. So I'm very excited about, about that happening. That's, that's happening, you know, um, in a couple of days, they're going to be in every Burger King nationwide. Another thing to celebrate, Amy Jean Davis, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I'm so glad you're on the planet (laughs) (laughs) doing all the work you're doing. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Oh, all right, everybody, you need to visit the Save Movement at thesavemovement.org. Very oh, excellent work, very important. I'm on the radio. Okay, now let's move to my next guest. 
And my next guest is Laura Reese of Vegan Justice League. Now, Laura's got a Renaissance woman biography with a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering. And she's worked in the semiconductor industry and then studied personal finance. <coughs> Excuse me. And then started researching our food system. Only a couple of years ago, adopted a vegan lifestyle and is now part of the Vegan Justice League. And we're going to hear more about that right now. Laura, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, just briefly, it was a couple of years ago. What was it for you that turn the vegan light on for you? Uh, well, I have terrible allergies in my face, <laughs> you know, nasal, sinus, sinusitis all the time, asthma too. And I, <clears throat> I tried doing an elimination diet. I read a book that a friend gave me that was on epigenetics and thought, you know, midway through the book, maybe food has something to do with it, even though, though I never really tested positive for food. So I limited my food for a full month and I was really just eating a whole food plant-based diet minus a handful of typical allergens like peanuts. And um, in doing that, I just, I think I just became open to learning about what this diet was all about. So I found all the typical documentaries, you know, about, you know, what the health works with the knives and then I watched Cowspiracy and, you know, the whole vegan funnel of documentary documentaries. Yep. And I was watching Carnage swallow the swallowing the past, a mockumentary, a you know, a joke movie by Simon Amstel on veganism with my son, thirteen year old son. At the time I guess he was twelve. And um at the end of the movie he just said, Let's he said, Let's go vegan and um and i uh my husband was kind of half listening in the background he said all right let's go vegan and i said let's go vegan <laughs> i mean we were all three kind of well on our way anyway i definitely was and then you know watching earthlings i made myself watch it twice because you know i was so steeped in carnism i just wanted to remember um yep. it's really easy for for me to compartmentalize and see animals as things rather than fellow earthlings that I just, I didn't want, I wanted to, um, I wanted to impair that, that tool in my brain. So, um, I couldn't not see them as, as fellow earthlings. So, um, that's, that's kind of how it got started. Okay. I'm curious because you, you haven't been vegan very long, a couple of years and you've just like totally immersed yourself and, you're involved with the Vegan <laughs> Justice League, which we're, we're going to talk about in a moment, which is really important, great work. I like to ask people who are new vegans um, what you were thinking about before you became a vegan. You must have known that vegans were out there. What was your... I, I know it took just, the films to figure it out, but were you just not thinking about food? I just, I'm just curious. Because for me, I became vegan 31 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, really? Um, I I just thought the way we ate was uh, normal, necessary, natural. Well, maybe right. not natural because of all the the um, processing in our food. But I thought it was normal and, nat- and necessary. And it, it just kind of... When I realized that eating animals just wasn't necessary, it, you know, you ask yourself, well, then why am I eating them? Yep. That kind of came you know, down it's to It's an that. interesting, I we think, were just talking in the first part of the program how we're programmed as children. And there's this mm-hmm. irony because we're taught to love animals and then we're taught that it's okay to kill them. doesn't make any right. sense. Right. Yeah, I mean it's absurd. It's it's um it's tragic when I see videos of kids and their like 4H, their little calf they raised is being yeah. ta- taken to the sale barn to be sold off for slaughter, and they're they're crying. I just think, yeah, that kid gets it, and then 
he or she is being told by all the adults around them, you know, they're almost ridiculed for that. And what a shame. That can't bode well for them in their adult life when they've buried no, away no. something like that. Yeah, no. All right, tell me about the Vegan Justice League. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Vegan Justice League, um, we, have, we really just have one simple purpose. We want to lobby against animal agriculture subsidies. Um, and the first step, our, our lobbying campaign we're pursuing right now is what I brought into Vegan Justice League, which was where I, I hadn't heard of Connie Spence. I hadn't heard of, you know, I didn't know anybody in the vegan movement. And after, shortly after going vegan, I started to read a lot about the impact of animal art agriculture and actually looking at the studies of methane emissions and water pollution, and I was horrified. So yeah, it's scary. I, yeah, I mean, it was beyond anything I could have imagined. I, I just couldn't believe it. And it wasn't just cowspiracy. It was looking at, like, the IPCC reports and Livestock's Long Shadow and um, – a couple of more up-to-date um, publications. So I found out about this organization called Lobbyists for Good, and I applied to do a lobbying campaign with them to end all animal agriculture subsidies. Well, of course, that's a little much to, to chew on off the bat. Mm -hmm. So we came up with, with a pilot program to help animal agriculture or animal farmers transition to plant farming or other sustainable, non-exploitative businesses. And so we lobbied in February for that um, legislation, and we're still lobbying for it. And since then, I've brought it to the Vegan Justice League, and that's, that's the first legislation that we are lobbying for. And right now, we're, we're crafting our strategy for the Hill uh, in September and going forward into the fall to get that legislation passed. Well, what's so important and smart about it is it's very easy to say, this is wrong, we shouldn't do this. But to offer a solution and give someone a path to move away from right. something and towards something better is, is something that's workable. I remember yeah, exactly. um, I had this opportunity. I spoke to 250 cattle producers at a feedlot in Nevada just before a bull sale. And the owner, she blew my mind, but she decided to have this um, panel to talk about animal agriculture's impact on climate change. And she wanted to have a vegan on the panel, and I was the lucky one. I thought they were going to kill wow. me, but they were very respectful. And and I, and I unfortunately, I, I wasn't given enough time to talk, but um, they they don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do other than raise animals. This is what's been in their family for a long time. And I think a lot of them are starting to get it. And uh, as I was just talking with the my previous guests, now there are all these plant meats coming out. And it's com giving them competition, too. And they need a way out. Yeah, there's a, a book called um, Switch by the Heath Brothers. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it is that I remember that I, I, I've i taken with me and adopted is the whole concept of shape the path. If you, if you want people to change, you can't just point out what's wrong. You need to make them a little uncomfortable, certainly, with, with, with the status quo and make them look at it. But the next, in the next breath, you need to shape the path for what they can do to get out of being part of the problem and start being part of the solution. So you need both. So that's what we see this legislation um, as being, is, is shaping the path so that animal farmers who electively want to stop being part of the problem and want to be start being part of the solution and maybe growing crops to um, sell to impossible foods or to beyond meat, you know, and make money without asking for handouts from the government, which most farmers don't want to do that. I think some of the big agribusinesses, they're pretty comfortable with taking government money. But, the, for example, a dairy farmer I'm working with in Wisconsin who really wants to transition, he, he doesn't want to take handouts. He wants to make his own money. Mm. But mm -hmm. that's, at least that's my impression. 
So yeah, if we can shape the path and get and transition them into lucrative businesses where they're still their own bosses, still get to use their own land, they're just not using animals and they're not and they're no longer polluting the planet. Maybe they're actually rebuilding soil and sequestering carbon by rewilding some of their land. Yeah, we should absolutely show them how they can do that. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. I know I had heard about this one story in Finland that I think occurred in the 70s, and I tried to find out more follow-up information on it, and I could never find it. But the government realized that dairy wasn't good for the public, and they offered some dairy farmers a transition to growing raspberries, I think it was. And it was a great story, but I don't know what's come of it since then. I'm going to have to Google that. Thank you. Yeah. Please do. And then come back and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for the, the Vegan Justice League specifically, um, I when I was raising funds, I was trying to raise $5,000 for the Lobbyist for Good campaign, and I kept hearing people say, hey, you need to get in touch with Connie Spence, Vegan Batgirl. And so I, I joined in her, her meetings once a week and just, started helping out wherever I could. I started out helping with, out with research. And then um, now I'm, I'm just spending almost all my time on it. And what we're doing is very simple. We're asking people to sign up to give monthly contributions. $10 a month is really what we recommend, but people can sign up for as little as a dollar a month because what we need is regular money coming in so that we can have a lobbying force in place that's always working. So we're not just doing one-off projects. We have an actual presence in Washington, D.C., because when I was lobbying there for three weeks, many of the lobbyists said to me, there's a phrase here, and it's when you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And Mm -hmm. to go for just one campaign, fine, you might get a piece of legislation passed or you might block another, but these guys in the animal ag industry, they're spending $40 million a year They've got somebody on Capitol Hill at all times. Yep. Whispering in everyone's ears. Mm -hmm. And listening to what's going on and forming strategy to get extract as much of our tax money to line the pockets of people who are exploiting animals for profit. It's not right. One of the things we've been hearing more about, which in some ways you could look at it positively, is the the people that are involved with making milk products and making meat products and making cheese products, making butter products, don't want vegan people using the words milk, cheese, butter, and meat. And some right. of the states have been successful in passing laws that say we can't we can't call vegan butter butter. Um, mm-hmm. Miyoko's putting a little sticker on her vegan cultured butter now in Wisconsin it, that says vegetable spread. We all know what it is. The people that mm-hmm. want it, that's what they want. They don't want the dairy. We know it, but they're getting nervous. They're seeing their loss in market share, and so they're getting their way in terms of the vocabulary. Um, so in some ways I see that as positive, but it's crazy what they're doing. And we need more lobbyists to fight that. Absolutely. I mean, I see these efforts to um, police language on packaging as sort of like what a aging, dying cash cow industry does when it has a lot of money, but it's not innovating new products. And so it goes to the government to get handouts. It goes to the government to erect barriers to entry into their, their markets. And this is just the classic play of, of dying industries. And rather than putting them on life support or, um, creating new laws around language to protect their last, their dying industry, um, we just need them to transition into the new food economy, which is plant-based. And no, I'm not a not big fan of these overnight. big corporations, especially these big food corporations, but um, some of them are getting it, and they know if you can't beat them, join them. And you take, yes. there are so many examples of like um, 
Oh, what's Tyson their, has been uh, a trip to watch. Unilever, for example, they yeah. they make uh, okay. Hellman's mayonnaise on the East Coast and and Best Foods on the West Coast, and they were fighting <laughs> with the company that's now called Just. It, it's had a number of different names over the years, but they make a, a vegan mayo, and they were saying you can't call it mayo, and they fought with them, and then they finally just dropped out and decided to make their own vegan mayo. Yeah. I'm not going to buy it, but I'm glad they're making <laughs> vegan mayo. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a complicated situation when you're talking about big co- corporations whose main product is animal-based foods. But yeah, yeah ultimately, if they're going to move it, I would rather them move into the plant-based markets than fight against the plant-based markets. Okay, so I'm on the Vegan Justin League, Justice League website on your frequently asked questions. Can you mm-hmm. t- talk about this statement? How can you claim no animals are being saved despite our vegan activism? <laughs> yeah, it's it, we run into a lot of pushback when we say um, when we make statements about how do you know that animals are actually being saved and people will write, will send us an article. And when you look through the article, it's almost always a back of the napkin calculation where somebody's saying, oh, well, each vegan is not eating a hundred animals, give or take, and multiply it Mm -hmm. by the number of vegans and that's the number of animals saved. But if you look at the USDA website and you look at the, the production numbers and you look at the, especially the stockpile of the oversupply of the of the glut in production, and what the um, what farmers, American Farmers Union president called a chronic oversupply, meaning it's always happening. Um, you see that the animal production is going up despite vegans, and you can say. When you look at it, you go, well, okay, well, the population's growing faster than the vegan population is, but the vegan population still should have some effect, and also the people who are reducitarians should be having some effect. I mean, heck, my parents stopped, they started drinking Ripple two years ago, but the local dairy farmers are getting, I just read an article about how they're getting paid by the federal government to keep producing because the, the poor farmers, the price of milk is low. Well, the price of milk is low because people don't want to buy it. <laughs> so they're still they're still breeding just as many cows, polluting the rivers, um, killing the salmon, and emitting greenhouse gases to the tune of like 300 kilograms per milking cow, if you include everything around them. Um, yeah, so that's that's where it comes from. I'm not we're not saying that our vegan choices have no effect. They absolutely do. We are. We are growing the plant-based food market, which is absolutely critical because om- omnis and carnists and, and reducitarians alike, that just gives them more options, which is great. But we aren't, our market signal is at best being muted, but really I think it's, it's completely disconnected from the production plans of animal ag because they get paid anyway. They get paid, and these are insurance schemes. Uh, years ago, the subsidy schemes in the Farm Bill went from being handouts to being more, quote-unquote, insurance. But really, that just means when the margins drop low enough, they get paid. Well, that's margins drop low. Uh, maybe it's because the demand's dropping that they get paid anyway. Or, um, yeah, so they're just disconnected from the lo- the usual laws of supply and demand. And we are determined to go to Capitol Hill and make them pay play by the same rules that all the other industries are made to play by that. We've been good. taught that unfortunately that the, taught the, children, and holy, the children, the right? children, I'm sorry. I wanted to say the children like, lose too, because when there's a, an excess of food that isn't being sold in the dairy industry, it goes to the school lunch program. Oh, and that just breaks my heart. I mean, you read yep. these studies about the correlation of type 1 diabetes and drinking cow's milk. Um, and you read about asthma and about 
I mean, kids have plaque in their in their veins before they're twenty. So what's really nutty is the tax system, and there's a lot of people that don't like paying a lot of tax and we have the Republican Party that's changed the whole system and they're always saying we need to tax less, not more. And so we should be taxing less and not paying all these subsidies. It doesn't make sense. Exactly. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons why we wrote our legislation the way we wrote it, because it's really not Democrat or Republican. It's very much about the justice of not using our, of using the injustice of using our tax dollars to put a finger on the scale in the free market. So we're, we're looking for bipartisan support in the, the House and the Senate, um, and hopefully we'll we'll get it. We've got a plan. We'll see if we can execute to it. But yeah, we're using a lot of those talking points that um, people in the GOP uh, would use, and I have no problem with that. Most of my family's Republican, so mm-hmm. I hear their talking <laughs> points all the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. What about the Democratic presidential candidates that are stumping around these days? Is is there any way to get them informed about the work that you're doing? Certainly Cory Booker would be somebody who might be interested, but um, I think a number of them, this should be an important campaign point. Yeah, I can. So part of our strategy for September, we're going to focus on the Senate and we're also going to corral the support among the core supporters in the house. And um, certainly Cory Booker is somebody who we're targeting um, and then for some of the other candidates, like uh, Yang, I could see him being on board with this. I could see Buttigieg, I don't know if he's saying his name right, being on board with this. Elizabeth mm-hmm. Warren, for sure. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I, I just want to mention Elizabeth Warren for a moment, and I love her. And I, I, she's one of my favorites of the potential Democratic candidates. But I was informed that she did support... Um, this law to protect the dairy farmers, uh, and I think it had to do with um, calling the the dairy products dairy and and the the semantics portion. Oh, well, I'm not remembering it all right now, but she was either one of the sponsors or a supporter of it. So she needs a little more education mm. when it comes to <laughs> animal agriculture. It sounds like it. Uh, I talked with a couple of Bernie Sanders' staffers when I was in lobbying in February, and they were certainly open to the idea of helping dairy farmers transition. They liked the idea of giving that as an option to their dairy farmers who are feeling the, the, um, the prices fall and mm-hmm. who see that you know subsidies can only last so long and um, maybe transition to something different. Uh, they weren't as as pro dairy as Bernie Sanders is, and he kind of has to be. I mean, that's a huge part of their agricultural uh, economy. It's something like two thirds of their agriculture income is from the dairy yep. industry. Um, he can't he can't not support them. So um, we're hoping that the legislation that we're pushing even would appeal to a politician like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders who are um, outwardly very pro-dairy farmers. So um, it's kind of hard to oppose what we have, what we've put together. The trans, the transition concept is genius. And I really wish you the best of luck with that. That's the ticket. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The Vegan Justice League is, um, we're going to be, I think, I think we stand a good chance of pushing this through. Um, Lobbyists are expensive, but we've got a great partner in Lobbyists for Good. Uh, They're a platform for individuals and for nonprofits. So um, I would recommend if anybody has a, a, uh, you know, election reform or like making sure that all the, the, the primary and 
general election debates are held by C-SPAN, not by corporate news, for example. Like, if that's what you care about, go to Lobbyists for Good and start a campaign. I would totally be doing that, but my hands are full. I want to focus on speaking <laughs> There's only so much we can all do. But the thing yeah, behind lobbying, lobbying and, and you've mentioned it already, is money. And mm-hmm. the, the monsters have all the money. And they do all the, quote, educating of our representatives because yeah. they have all the lobbyists, they can afford it, and they can craft their plan. And there's mm-hmm. just no one really out there on the other side, and we need to be there. And the way to be there is money. Can I just say, yes, we need money, but one thing we are also doing is we're starting a DIY local lobby, Vegan Justice League DIY local lobbying series where we're tapping into the talents of people who have been lobbying at their city councils and lobbying at the state level and having them do webinars where we can go in and do Q&As and they'll impart their wisdom and what they've learned about the tips and tricks of going to your local government and um, lobbying yourself because you don't have to pay someone But it does take, um, I think it's worth learning from people who have have learned their lessons the hard way. And people could go, say, research their local property tax laws and see if it favors cattle ranching and Mm. lobby to have that equalized so maybe it it favors rewilding. Um, You could go educate your council about the true effects of animal agriculture. And our first series panelist is Neon Gore in Berkeley, and he's going to talk about a ways you can educate your local cities about using uh, consumption-based estimates for environmental impact versus production, or no, maybe it's the opposite, production-based <laughs> impacts versus consumption-based, so that they actually take into account the true costs of animal agriculture and having barbecue in the city. Um, all these sorts of things, these are at the local level, and people can do them. They don't need to hire a big, swanky lobbyist. Get a few friends together, do this local lobbying series, um, go to a few meetings, don't talk at first, just listen, kind of get to know who the players are, and get and just get started. Find one issue, work on it. These are really great points, very empowering. Thank you for sharing them with us. Working at the local level is so very important. Laura Reese, thank you for joining me today and to talk about the Vegan Justice League. I'm so thrilled to hear about this work. No, oh, I'm it's my pleasure to do it. I I think the more we join forces, the more effect we can have. So, you know, people can go to veganjusticeleague.com and check us out. Sounds good. veganjusticeleague.com. Thanks again for joining me and it's all about food. And that's the end of the show, everybody. Thanks for joining me. And we'll be back next week. In the meantime, have a delicious week. Bye-bye.